Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to go ahead and get started. And you are here for Kutsa Chats. Have fun with it. Staff Assembly Fundraising Excellence. And we're really glad to have you here. And as a heads up, this is being recorded. So smile. <laughs> we'll go ahead and get started. And I wanted to start just by noting that as an organization, we did want to create a land acknowledgement just to speak to the matters of in the Indigenous people of California. And I've placed that here. So I'll go ahead and read that out. The Council of UC Staff Assemblies recognizes that our service occurs on the unceded territory of the Indigenous peoples of California and that these lands were and continue to be of great importance to them. Every member of our community has and continues to benefit from the use and stewardship of these lands. With respect and gratitude, we acknowledge and make visible our relationship to the original caretakers. I've also placed a few links here below, and we want to further recommend use of the following resources to better understand the Indigenous history of our state. And I'm happy to share that with anyone who is interested in giving those a look. The next step is to share the normal Zoom etiquette. I know we've been doing this for quite a while already. But this is being recorded, as I mentioned a moment ago. We do ask that you leave your microphone muted during the event. And this will be placed on social media for Kuxa for future viewing. So we do encourage you to share it with people that you think may find it interesting. And then when it comes to questions and answers, we will answer them towards the end of the presentation. We do ask that you type the questions into chat. So let's go ahead and get started just by introducing the people participating. And I'll start with myself. My name is Dennis McIver. I am the chair of the Council of UC Staff Assemblies. My pronouns are he, him, and his. I have six years of service and I'm inching in on seven years. I am also a financial services analyst for UCR's graduate division. I'm co-founder of the Black Leadership Alliance Council at the University of California. I'm also a past president of UCR Staff Assembly, as well as the past chair of UCR's Black Faculty and Staff Association. Now, I do want to say one of the real perks of being a part of KUXA is being able to connect with some really cool people, and that includes the members of this panel. So let's go ahead and introduce them. I want to start with Joy Kruger, who is a KUXA alumni delegate, as well as a past president of UCLA Staff Assembly, and we do have a biography. Joy Kruger is a past president of the UCLA Staff Assembly. Joy earned their MBA in 2011 from University of Portland with an emphasis in marketing and entrepreneurship. After graduating, Joy began a career in nonprofit fundraising. Joy led the advancement efforts as director of donor relations for Multnomah University for two years before moving to Los Angeles. In LA, Joy worked at a full service marketing agency using best industry practices, years of experience in testing, Joy developed and implemented the strategy for membership and fundraising for several great organizations, including the National History Museum of LA, the Heard Museum of Phoenix, the National History Museum of Utah, and California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. When out of the office, Joy enjoys making and experiencing art, reading, and walking around Hollywood. So welcome to Joy. Up next, we have Kevin Baldwin at UCLA. Kevin is currently a portfolio manager at UCLA Health and a past president of UCLA Staff Assembly. His previous roles at UCLA include positions in recreation, housing and hospitality services, the School of Medicine, and the School of Public Health. He kicked off several fundraising and corporate sponsorship initiatives during his time serving as Staff Assembly president and looks forward to sharing some best practices and meeting new colleagues today. So welcome and thank you, Kevin. And then from UC Davis, we have Dr. Heather Hunter. And Dr. Heather Hunter is leading the new UC Davis-wide collaborative corporate partnership block <laughs> initiative for UC Davis. She is responsible for establishing and executing a comprehensive campus-wide strategy for securing business partnerships that align with the UC Davis principles of community and mission. Prior to UP3, she was the Associate Executive Director and Chief Revenue Officer for the UC Davis Cal Aggie Alumni Association. Heather is a graduate of UC Davis, where she double majored in American Studies and Psychology. She earned her master's degree in sports management from the University of San Francisco and her doctorate in educational leadership and innovation from the University of the Pacific. Heather was also a four-year letter winner at softball at UC Davis and is a member of the Cal Aggie Athletics Hall of Fame. Welcome, Heather, and we're happy to have you here as well. And then finally, 
we have Lauren McDermott, who is current chair of the UC Davis Staff Assembly. Lauren joined the UC Davis community in 2013, and currently serves as a member of the Student Financial Support Team in Graduate Studies. In her previous roles, she worked in the College of Letters and Sciences and School of Education, supporting events and business administration. Lauren joined Staff Assembly as a member of the Citations for Excellence Committee. Serving on that committee really opened her eyes to the incredible impact staff have on our universities and how integral each one of us is making the University of California a true place of excellence. She continued on as events co-chair, chair-elect, and is now chair on the UC Davis Executive Committee. She looks forward to working with fellow CUPSA delegates, as she is a senior delegate, and continuing the work of creating spaces for staff voices to be heard and to provide opportunities that foster connection, promote well-being, and celebrate our diverse and dedicated staff community. And on that note, we'll go ahead and stop share for this one. We're going to go ahead and now go ahead and begin by talking about the experience at UCLA. And since we are doing a bit of a coin toss, we'll go ahead and start with Joy. So Joy, I'm going to go ahead and give you co-host and the floor is yours. Hello, hello. Um, thank you everyone for letting me uh, share in this experience today. Um, so UCLA does a lot of fundraising, um, both as an institution and also on the UC staff assembly side of things. Um, so this is something that I'm hoping that if anyone finds anything of interest that you're able to pull any pieces that are useful um, and use those at your home campus as well. Um, so at UCLA, I was first a fundraiser. Um, so I joined UCLA as a major gift officer for the college, uh, fundraising for math, statistics, and chemistry and biochemistry, um, and then later in the Department of Ophthalmology, um, and then joined Staff Assembly later on. And so when I moved into the role of president, um, I came into some of those conversations about um, some multi-year partnerships and that side of things, having in my back pocket the fundraising side of things, my day job, um, so able to use some of that stuff. Um, so things that we've found really helpful um, are, one, um, fundraise. Um, don't be afraid to ask for money. Um, and this was something that was particularly interesting to me coming into this space um, as as part of Cooksa um, is that we're really able to use a lot of those corporations, foundations that want to be a part of what your UC staff assembly is doing anyway, leverage that to get a meaningful partnership deal. Um, so for instance, we in the past had been doing little one-offs where we're like, hey, will you give us $1,000, $5,000 to be a part of our um, 5K or um, other signature event. And instead of continuing with those little things, we said, hey, why don't we partner some of the bigger ticket things and say, okay, for 40,000 a year, three-year deals, we're willing to work with you and do X, Y, Z, really put together some different options. Um, so what we did was present, I believe, three different options. So a bronze, a silver, and a gold level um, to some of our financial partners who had been partners with us in the past, who had done some of these little one-off things um, to say, okay, we know that you care about having access to our staff. Um, so this is what a meaningful partnership would look like for us. Um, we did get a little bit of pushback of like, well, do we really need to be at that level? Do we want to be at this level? And I was like, hey, if you want access to staff, like here's what it's going to take. It's got to be a meaningful partnership. We get emails all the time from people saying, oh yeah, I'd love to do a newsletter inclusion for $1,000 and have you blast that I'll do mortgages for everybody. And it's like, I'm sure you would love that for a thousand dollars. That would be an amazing ROI to get access to 50,000 staff. Um, but we're not really interested in diluting uh, the brand that we have for a thousand dollars. So being able to think big picture and you never know until you ask. Um, so we were able to lock in two separate three-year commitments at about 40,000 a year Per place. So we've got one with Westcom, which is a credit union um, that is the financial partner of most of UCLA. Um, we did, though, a 
non-exclusive deal with them because we also really like university credit union. Um, and so we did non-exclusive financial partnership deals with both of them at about 40-ish, 40 45, 50,000 a piece um, per year. And they get different benefits, different perks, um, separating those out, but being very clear to both of them that we do work with both. Um, so of course we would never send an email um, from each of them during the same week. We want to separate. They've got brand identity that we want to be really careful about being a good partner to them in return. Um, so that was something that we found to be super successful um, on the bigger picture items. And then I believe Anna Esquivel and um, others can talk to some of the other details about uh, smaller partnership deals as well. But those were some of the ones that um, I wanted to bring to the attention of the group here. Great. Thank you so much, Joy. Really appreciate that. And we're fortunate that we have a few different folks from UCLA that are in the room. So we'll go ahead and pass it over to Kevin next to speak to any of his experiences he's able to share. Hey, everyone. Um, and, and thanks uh, for arranging this, uh, Dennis. I think it's, it's fantastic to have this brain trust of UC staff that we can uh, share you know, best practices uh, with one another. So um, a little bit um, about my perspective or, or kind of fundraising journey. Um, when I came in to uh, our staff assembly executive board, this was probably in 2017, so, so pre-pandemic, um, I think the board had always been interested in, in fundraising. And, and we had a few very successful fundraisers. Joy alluded to um, the virtual 5K, which actually used to be a physical 5K and, and due to logistical reasons, uh, actually pre-COVID, we, we moved it to virtual. Um, every year the board would, would uh, put on this event and we would um, uh, solicit sponsorships, both internal and external. I think that's maybe a key point is, is um, think sometimes looking internal is, is also a great avenue because there's a lot of departments and different entities at our, our site. So um, we've worked with um, our recreation teams, with our athletics teams, with alumni, they all do their own, right, kind of promotional activities, and, and they love to, to partner with staff. So I, I think look at those options. Um, five of our campuses have medical centers that are all, you know, interested in, and eager to, to grow and expand and, and you know, make their uh, brands more visible as well. So we've done some um, kind of sponsorship arrangements with, um, with our health uh, system as well. Um, so we did uh, kind of these various one-off events uh, like uh, Joy alluded to. Um, my year, or I should say the year before, we we actually um, created a VP of development position. So we, we thought it, that this topic is important enough that there should be a dedicated person that's actually thinking about this kind of as their, their primary responsibility. And um, that role is still in place today. Um, I think we've had people come into that role that came from a development background. So they kind of, they were recruited specifically because they have that expertise and um, that network. But we've actually also had some very successful VPs of development that had zero development experience and they were interested in learning more about it. And they, they used kind of the, the staff assembly volunteer opportunity as a way to um, get immersed in that and, and learn about, you know, what, what is development and how do we um, make it successful. Um, the other thing I um, would mention is um, above me on internal partnerships, uh, because the UC is so large, uh, I think all of our campuses are, are going to have, you know, kind of networks that reach into the community. And um, one example that I thought was very fun, we actually, we were always looking for ways to expand our events to, to include the entire UC system, not just um, UCLA. Um, one event we did my year was there was a former UCLA staff member that left UCLA and was at the time working for NBC Universal. Um, she still had connections to people at UCLA. We, uh, you know, reached out to her. She reached out to us. Maybe I, I don't recall what the first you know, point of communication was, but there was an interest in, in finding ways to have UCLA partner with, with her new organization. And long story short, we ended up um, developing an event um, at Universal Studios during their, I think it was during their Christmas time. So it was kind of a holiday themed, uh, kind of picnic theme for, for UCLA staff. And we made that available to the entire UC system. So we did have, it's a little bit far for, for our, our, our friends uh, up north, but I, I know we had a, a handful of people from um, UC San Diego and, and Irvine uh, that did make make use of those tickets because it was, it was a really good deal. It was uh, a discounted price that included parking and, and a meal, et cetera. So you can get very creative, I think, in, in making exclusive opportunities for, for staff, again, both with internal partners um, or, uh, or external partners as well. Um, 
And then the maybe the final thing I'll, I'll mention, and then I'll, I'll turn it back to Dennis, is um, during our year there was a, a larger fundraising effort around our um, our centennial, around you know celebrating um, UCLA's um, hundredth birthday, and so there was a lot of uh, development uh, activities happening. And um, we started to think about how do we like put a focus on staff? How do we make sure staff aren't forgotten? It's not just about alumni or students or, or faculty that we're also um, you know, being thought of. And, and actually one of the partners that uh, Joy mentioned, University Credit Union, um, uh, reached out to us. We started having um, conversations with them and they very graciously uh, decided to um, uh, sponsor or you know donate uh, what would be the equivalent of of about a hundred scholarships in honor of uh, of UCLA's um, centennial. And what we did with that, we actually um, ended up putting all of that money into the first um, staff scholarship endowment. So at the time, we wanted to make sure that it wasn't just sitting in an account that you know future boards could take in many different directions. We want to make sure that we we protected the integrity of, of that money and that it was always going to be um, for for staff scholarships. Um, and to this day, that's continued to um, accrue interest, and and boards have continued to um, add more funds to that as as they've uh, done fundraising efforts. And kind of the the cream on 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 top of that particular partnership is at the time there was a 50% uh, scholarship match for student scholarships. So the, the chancellor's office was very interested in, in you know, uh, 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 boosting the student endowment for, for scholarship funding. And we worked with our development teams um, and we actually were able to, to convince the chancellor's office to make the same uh, opportunity available for staff. So he actually gave us a 50% match on, on the money that we raised. So um, I think all these things, are, the, the, the takeaway for me is there's a lot of internal right, entities and resources and, and people and groups. And um, I think just if, if you get creative and, and you think about you know aligning yourselves with other campus initiatives, um, as well as looking outside uh, to your, you know, your network, your, your, your campus's network and think about what, what are the interesting venues or you know, sports uh, groups or, or et cetera, et cetera, that, you know, we could align ourselves with that might be interested in hosting staff. And money doesn't even necessarily have to ex exchange hands. It could just be they give some sort of exclusive opportunity that, you know, is, is a, a privilege just, you know, being being a, a UC staff member. So, yeah, um, a lot of fun stuff. And and, and uh, I think have fun with it and do things that, you know, you and your families and your friends and, and colleagues would, would, you know, appreciate as well. Um, so I'll stop there. Thanks everyone for for uh, for listening, and and uh, I look forward to to continuing the conversation, Dennis. Thank you so much, Kevin. I, I appreciate that, and I would add it is very important to have fun while you're having fun. So <laughs> so thank you so much for sharing. Okay, we'll go ahead and jump over to discuss UC Davis and Lauren Heather. I know y'all are going to work together on this. And I'm going to do a screen share because we do have a slideshow. So hopefully it works, <laughs> but here it is. And Lauren, Heather, just say next slide or whatever you want, and I'll make sure I keep up. Okay, great. And Dennis, thanks again for, I mean, having me. And uh, Lauren, thanks for inviting me to the uh, to this conversation. Um, so kind of the first thing that I'm going to kind of talk about is just kind of our program and how we're situated. Uh, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, Staff Assembly is a very important partner um, to our preferred partnership program. Uh, what our uh, partnership program does is that we secure university-wide preferred business partners. Uh, we execute a comprehensive campus uh, strategy that includes, includes staff, faculty, uh, alumni, and students. Uh, we look to merge campus services contract with process and sponsorship. So we work closely uh, with our procurement team. Uh, we go to we look to leverage the UC Davis brand. Um, so one of the things with that, right, logo lockups, um, you've probably seen that, um, you know, with, at UCLA and Westcom was mentioned earlier. Um, and then just we're one point of contact for preferred partners. So there's an assistant director that works within our office uh, that coordinates with staff assembly uh, to ensure, right, that anything that we put into a university wide contract, um, that we make sure that we're working together. Uh, and then just, right, we manage the campus uh, commercial activities policy um, here on campus. Uh, next slide. So from a, a governance structure, and I'm gonna get to the next slide. Um, this is how we're governed. Uh, we have industry working groups uh, and advisory committee. And then of course, everything before we finalize a partnership goes to the Chancellor's Leadership Council. Um, you'll see all our stakeholders and communities that we represent uh, below. Um, you'll see that uh, staff is part of that. 
Um, but from a staff assembly uh, representation, uh, next slide, please. So for, on the advisory council, um, Roger Mori and Lisa Feldman are uh, the co-finance chairs that represent staff assembly. Uh, basically, the advisory council advises our office on policies, procedures of our operations, uh, consults us on new industries of opportunity, um, which I can talk a little bit about uh, later on and how we identify potential categories, uh, reviews industry working group recommendations for partnerships, and then sends opportunities uh, that they endorse to the CLC uh, for approval. And then from an industry working group standpoint, so anytime we start a campus-wide category, we put together a, a working group um, that helps us basically build out the proposal and approves the assets or marketing sponsorship benefits that go into an agreement. So they help us develop, if we do an RFP or request proposal or the actual partnership agreement, um, they evaluate and review proposals for potential partnerships for individual categories. Uh, and then they recommend any business partnerships for approval to our advisory committee. And the composition will be determined by our office and the advisory committee. Uh, but one of the working groups that actually we have a, a meeting this afternoon um, is we have our beverage pouring rights uh, agreement is up in August of 2024. Uh, so Roger Moy is uh, representing uh, staff assembly, um, so it'll be an important voice um, as we move through this process um, to renew our beverage partnership. Next slide, and Lauren. Yeah, and so uh, in the next part, I'll talk a little bit about how staff assembly works with the preferred partnership um, office. So if you want to go to the next slide, Dennis. So um, every time we reach kind of the end of the, or within the process of those industry working groups, um, part of that discussion is terms with those partners on how they'll support staff assembly, um, what value we bring to those partners and writing it all out in an MOU um, to kind of outline funding we can expect for a certain period of time and then what is expected of us as staff assembly uh, on our side of the partnership. And if you wanna to go to the next slide, there's some examples there. Um, so here are the terms for uh, two of our partnerships. Pepsi right now is our biggest partnership. And this is the partnership that is um, due to expire soon. So that's the beverage um, industry working group that Roger will be sitting on. Uh, so we'll have an opportunity to revisit their contribution and what we would like to ask of each other uh, in terms of that partnership. Um, so one of our biggest things is, is like Kevin and Joy mentioned is the ability for these partners to get in front of a large amount of staff in one go. Um, with our listserv that is an opt out listserv. So as a new staff member at UC Davis, you're automatically uh, enrolled into our staff voice, which is our newsletter sent out bi-weekly. Um, so we have that as a leveraging point with our partners uh, that if you know they want to be included there, it goes out to all of our staff as well as our thank goodness for staff event, which you'll see listed throughout as TGFS. And that's our large um, staff picnic where we have about 6,000 staff in our day program and about 400 for our night program. And we do a vendor showcase at each of those and gives an opportunity for these partners to sit directly in front of all of these staff. Um, oftentimes with our partnerships, we also leverage that and put them on the sponsor webpage, food truck webpage, web pages that we use analytics to gauge that are highest traffic. Um, and then those metrics, we work with Ethan and the UP3 office to put together um, analytics that we show this website's been visited this many times. Our newsletter got this many clicks for you. So as we move forward, we can show the value we give to these partners and are able to make those asks of, of them for financial funding. And then next slide. And this one is um, just the University Credit Union. This is our newest partnership on campus. And so that similar to the others outlines um, what they contribute and then what our end of the partnership is. And then next slide. And then other funding sources. So our presentation today mostly focused on our partnership with the UP3 office, um, but we do have other sources of funding. So pie chart here, uh, a lot of this is our general funds and that is hugely like our TGFS operation budget. 
Um, we do get funding from the chancellor's office for our staff awards. And then 10% uh, is other fundraising. And so for things like that, we have this staff pin program uh, on our homepage. You can see, we always try to highlight it. Folks can purchase a staff pin. Um, HR offers it to staff as they are onboarded and $10 from that goes to uh, staff assembly. There used to be more of a, a discount program associated with that and we're kind of revamping that this year. Um, with COVID, some of those partnerships are like we're looking to renew. Staff donations is another part of fundraising. Um, we've ran some campaigns, uh, crowdsource funding on staff giving, and it's a great way for staff to get involved and kind of give them an outcome of how it will directly benefit staff. And a lot of those donations go to scholarships. And I think uh, Kevin mentioned too, partnership with local sports teams. So right now we're planning a UC Davis and UC Davis Health staff day with the Kings and they give a portion of tickets to those games um, back to staff assembly. And then we have our one-time efforts. We've done t-shirt sales and other things like that as well to help raise funds. And then I will mention not included in this chart is our, we have a coordinator, so I didn't include their salary. And then scholarships are a mix. We have a couple of endowments from past chancellors and other staff who have given endowments. And then we also get a lot of our scholarship funds um, provided by our local campus employee resource groups as well. And so we kind of host the scholarship awards process, but a lot of those funds come from different sources. And all right, and I think that's it. Great, thank you so much, Lauren, Heather. That was, that was really good. And we have that presentation. I'm, I'm going to assume that it might be okay to share that, Lauren Heather, but if we can make that available to anyone that is interested. And in the time since, just making sure we don't have any other questions, seeing none, we can go ahead over to the discussion portion. Now, I did do some questions before, and we've already shared those, but if you have any that come to mind immediately, please feel free to place them in chat, and I'll be happy to make sure that they get read. So let's go ahead and start with the first question. And this was alluded to a little bit, but it's specifically, can anyone describe any examples of things you learned from less successful attempts at fundraising or partnerships? And Kevin, I think you mentioned it first. So I'm gonna ask if there are any lessons you'd be willing to provide and anyone else who wants to jump in, please feel free. Yeah, I mean, what, what I would say, um, is when um, our staff assembly was still, you know, um, I'll, I'll call young in, in its development, you know, phase, um, we didn't have well-defined um, like MOUs, like um, Lauren and, and uh, Heather mentioned, and um, kind of metrics and, and goals for the program. So we were, um, and because we're all volunteers, we were somewhat kind of creating them on the fly, but we didn't have a good benchmark or, or you know, good, basis for how to price, you know, different assets and, and so forth. So we were, I, I wouldn't necessarily say it was, it was a failure, but we, we were just kind of, you know, uh, what's the saying? Uh, we were building the plane as, as we were flying it. So um, I would say if, if, you're, if your organization, your staff assembly is just starting on, on this road, um, really having like a dedicated person, maybe consulting your local development office, getting them involved early because the templates are there, the tools are there. The experience is, is at all of our campuses, but don't feel like you have to, to do it alone. And we quickly did engage, you know, other people, you know, on the board and, and um, you know, across UCLA that had more experience that could say, maybe organize it like this, maybe price it like this, maybe, you know, market it or advertise it like this. So that I think was a, an early lesson learned from us. And, and since then, each board, even after I've left, has continued to kind of fine tune and innovate and, and, and make that more um, uh, easy to to market and communicate to people that might be interested in, in partnering with us. Great, thanks so much, Kevin. Lauren, Joy, Heather, would y'all have any pieces you'd like to share? 
I think the one that we had recently at UC, recently a year ago at UCLA was we had a very successful Spark campaign, the Kickstarter for UCLA, um, for staff assembly for scholarships the year before. Um, so our VP of development was like, well, that was great. Let's double our goal this year. Um, but without any real plan in place for how that extra funds was going to come in, um, we didn't hit that goal. Um, so that was something that I definitely would change in the future to either keep the same goal or make it a participation goal. So you're not like trying to hit $5,000 or something that's a little bit harder to hit for the community um, or have an actual plan for, okay, if we were able to get 2,500 last year and we're going for 5,000 this year or 5,000 last year and we're going for 10. What are those actual steps? Who have you already talked to to make sure that it's successful um, would be something I'd add. Yeah, and from a, a corporate partnerships perspective, um, I mean, I can share one learning lesson. We actually did a mobility RFP um, back in 2017 um, in which it took to about a year and a half to get to finally get to a place where we were ready to sign an agreement. And at the time we were ready to sign, leadership changed. Uh, we were actually working with General Motors and the entire agreement fell apart. So I think, you know, one learning lesson, if right, if you're going to be out selling corporate partnerships, and I think for like staff assembly, right, you're probably selling them annually. Um, but I would make sure, right, that that you're trying to basically move towards getting a signed agreement sooner rather than later. Um, because you never know, right, when leadership is going to change. And I think the second thing is, you know, maybe you move away from signing annual agreements and you, you make a goal of signing three to five year agreements um, so that you're not having to chase basically after the same dollar um, every single year. Really yeah, good points. Go ahead, Lauren. I'll just speak to you. not a major failure, but I will say, uh, We've had to reframe some of our outreach after the pandemic. Uh, we have the annual staff um, picnic and we, before the pandemic had 70 vendors, a lot of those external vendors um, and coming back, I think, you know, we were down to like 40 vendors. And I think the outreach was a little bit harder and kind of reframing and getting people back to staff. Some of the smaller businesses had shortages on staffing and resources. So I think that, um, took some time and then we did restructure our pricing a bit to kind of have those larger folks be able to buy larger packages. And then we have smaller pricing points for internal vendors and local businesses as well to give them the opportunity to get in front of staff, but maybe not at the price point as a larger business. These are all really good points. Thank you all for sharing them. I. I feel compelled to add some comments since I've had everyone speaking. I I've did have a chance to do a lot of work related to fundraising during my year as president. And one thing that I've learned is that sometimes it's just relative to that particular moment in time, that particular person in the office. And in certain cases, it just doesn't align in the way that you'd like, but it doesn't necessarily mean you walk away from it entirely. So I think it's being willing to take the lumps and being willing to revisit and try your best to preserve whatever relationship is there. So that way, maybe a year from now, when a new opportunity comes, there's an opportunity to just re-engage. But all these things, I think, can be kind of temporary. The main thing is to, I think, conduct yourself in a way and ask in a way that folks are willing to hear you out down the line. But a, a lot of it is about, I think, the relationships, and you want to try to preserve the relationship where you can, even if it doesn't go exactly the way you'd like in a given instance. Now, I did see we had a question in chat, so I want to sidestep a little bit. And we did receive a question related to the coordinator for staff assembly at UC Davis. I do want to acknowledge that I believe UC Merced, I'm not going to ask Austin or Alvin to jump in, but I know that they also recently established one, but Lauren, are you able to talk a little bit about the staff assembly coordinator? Because it is a fairly cool feature that y'all have out there. Yeah, um, so I know Jennifer Jackson's on the call and she may be able to speak to the history of the role a little bit more, um, but it was a position advocated for a few years back, particularly um, focusing on the need for support for our annual staff event. Um, and it really 
the, the funding from that has come from the chancellor's office. Uh, so we were able to get that approved as an annual position and it's a full-time career position. They've moved uh, around campus about three different times. And right now they're, they're sitting with our campus um, event services team, but they primarily work with the executive board and myself, the chair does most of the supervision for that um, as a volunteer. And then they also do have um, a supervisor within that unit as well who assist with the supervision and the admin sign. Um, but I know UC Merced too also just recently advocated. And so uh, Scott, our coordinator was able to help onboard that and it really does make a difference. So if anyone wants to see um, a PD for that position uh, or maybe reach out to Merced too on how we kind of advocated for that role, happy to provide that in a separate, it's probably a, a long list of things we, we advocated for, but yeah, happy to provide that resource if, if others are interested in it. Cool. Thank you so much for that explanation, Lauren. That was, that was great. And the next question that we have relates to time, because we know having had a chance to do these events that a big part of it is how, how much time you're able to do it. And so I was hoping that we could talk about when it comes to doing a successful plan, whether it's a fundraising event or even when it comes to developing a partnership, how much time would you say is generally needed to successfully execute one from start to finish? And since we started with Kevin first, I'm going to ask Heather if you'd be willing to speak a little bit to that. Yeah, so I think, you know, from our partnerships are, I mean, we start two years out. Um, it sounds a little crazy, but it honestly takes that long to get all the campus stakeholders kind of aligned and to ensure that we have the right people at the table and then also the right sponsorship benefits that are potentially going into a partnership. Um, so what I, what I try to do from my perspective is I try to carve out probably at least an hour a day, right? If I am in the middle of like with this beverage RFP, in which I'm working on things, whether it be the next uh, working group presentation, or you know, part of it is also we have to look at who are the uh, folks who we're going to actually go pitch to, because um, I need to set up time and and project out right when I'm going to have those external meetings um, with those beverage partners with with Coke or Pepsi, um, and then you know once the RFP is released, you know we're going to bring those folks to campus um, and then have scoring meetings. Um, so we actually have a full timeline that we've already built out um, six months in advance. We had it done um, this last year before we even started the working group. So I just think it's important to kind of lay out kind of, you know, what you're trying to achieve and then have some key uh, goals that, that you want to meet and kind of know kind of what your, your steps, your tactics are uh, to basically reach those goals. Thank you so much, Heather. And Lauren, Joy, Kevin, if you want to add any pieces, please feel free. Yeah, and from the staff assembly side, um, I would say for our largest event, uh, it's anywhere, it's usually about 10 months of planning and two months of wrap up, um, all for that hour and a half for those 6,000 folks that attend our staff picnic. Uh, and then we do uh, try to schedule with the chancellor in every July, we send a uh, request to his office of all the events we want him to attend for the year. And so we do a lot of scheduling around his availability. Um, and then we do our best to have an idea of when we want our larger events by no later than September. Uh, our first large event is usually a tailgate kickoff. Um, we partner with athletics. And we have about 400 staff out um, at our stadium there for that. And that we have shorter times so of two months, I think, um, or a month and a half by the time we onboard our executive committee. So it pretty much, it ranges, but we try to at least schedule things really far out, uh, especially if we're inviting campus leadership to attend. Great, thanks so much for that. And I do wanna do a quick time check for everyone. Kevin, I see you're ready to go, but. Folks, it's 12.44, so we'll start to wrap up towards 12.50 if you want to throw in any last-minute questions. Kevin, go for it. Yeah, for that question, I, I think what came to mind for me is just uh, you get out of it what you put into it, which, which I know is, is like many things in life. Um, but uh, there are obviously, you know, especially depending on where you are in the development journey, if there's opportunities for smaller partnerships, for, you know, one-off 
advertisements or promotional opportunities or, or you know, events, I would say take them and, and, you know, build a relationship with that partner over the long term. And there's the some of the larger scale partnerships that that Heather and uh, Lauren were describing that, that UC Davis has created. Um, I think that takes a lot of um, uh, institutional memory, right, and relationship building of, over over many years. Um, so I would say that whole spectrum is as a staff assembly, you should, you know, entertain, you know, those those opportunities as um, they come up. And then the second piece that actually as, as Heather and Lauren were talking, I would say is um, a project plan is definitely helpful. So for those of you that are in, you know, event planning, you're, you have, you know, your four weeks out, you know, eight weeks out, 12 weeks out, kind of what, what are the tasks that have to get done to make the event successful? I think development ideas and fundraising should just be embedded in that project plan. And uh, if you're starting, you know, planning event six months out, maybe at six months or five months, you have those initial conversations of who do we want to invite or who do we want to think would be a good partner for this type of event or initiative that, that Staff Assembly is pursuing. Great. Thanks so much, Kevin. Appreciate that additional content. And I have one last question that I'm going to pose, and it's a bit of an audible, so sorry to my panel, but I think it's important to, to bring up. And the question is this. Can you speak to the professional development value that has come from working in the space of advancement? Because I think all of us who have participated, we know we're doing things in these in staff assembly that are allowing us to grow as professionals. And so I was hoping we could speak on how this specific area of skills can benefit us professionally in the long term. And Heather, I'm going to start with you. <laughs> Sorry, I was having a problem with my arrow my mouse. Um, so I'll actually, I'll give an example of, I mean, how it's, you know, personally, I mean, helped me professionally. Um, so my background is solely in sponsorship and marketing. Um, I was in professional sports uh, prior to coming to Davis. And how I actually ended up at UC Davis was that um, I was in between um, roles and got elected to the CAAA alumni board um, because of my experience, because, right, I am a revenue generator, uh, business development. And that's an important skill set, usually for most boards um, or committees that you're going to sit on. So by sitting on that board um, and basically with my skill set, that's how it eventually rolled. I got my role uh, and my start, basically my end back at UC Davis uh, into the Alumni Association. So I think, you know, this, this sort of development or um, business development experience can benefit you, you know, I mean, not only in your professional career, but also, you know, as you're looking to um, basically give back to your community um, or, to, you know, pursue other avenues um, outside of uh, your professional role. Great. Thanks so much, Heather. Lauren, Joy, Kevin, would y'all have any piece to add? Lauren, I'll share a quick success story. Uh, the, the VP of development um, during during my term back in, in 2017-18, um, she at the time was in sales um, for housing and hospitality, but she was interested in, in you know, getting into development. So she, uh, she served on our board for two or maybe three years, um, got a lot of great experience and, and you know, started to learn about the actual process of, of fundraising and, and developing these, these uh, you know, long-term strategic partnerships. And um, the success story with her is she actually just got a job um, as, a, I think, uh, as an associate director of, of development for the health system. So she's still at UCLA, but I know she's been, you know, actively looking and interested in, in making that move. So she actually used it to, to pivot into uh, a development role, which is, is very exciting. Yeah, and I'll just add to, um, I think as you're, you know, finding these partnerships, et cetera, as you reach out to folks, I find that I'm more often getting yeses than noes. And I think it really does a lot to create a network um, outside of your volunteer role, et cetera. Uh, we work with, you know, UC Davis Athletics, the bookstore, um, outside vendors, et cetera. So you kind of get to know all these parts and really everyone, wants to put their name in front of staff and and is just looking to help support staff. So I think as you know, Kevin mentioned, it gives you the experience, but it also gives you a much broader network and kind of understanding of how campus works. Great. Thanks so much, Lauren. I'm going to give the last word or the last question because I was asked, I'm going to give it to Agam Patel, who's our Kutsu Senior Delegate from Riverside and current president of UCR Staff Assembly. So I, I know him a little bit. So Agam, okay. go ahead. 
Uh, thank you, Dennis, and good to see all of you. I see a lot of familiar faces. Um, I want to thank the panel for an interesting conversation. My question, I guess, is for some of the assemblies who may not have an existing partnership uh, with uh, some of the bigger corporate partners like Pepsi or Farmers, for example, um, I have certainly knocked on the door of our advancement officers and sometimes to no fruition. Uh, I'm sure other assemblies might have encountered those. If you don't have um, advancement officers working in your staff assembly board directors, it becomes a little more challenging. Is there a repository where we can access some of the contact, uh, some of the contacts for uh, Pepsi or farmers that serve all 10, 12 campuses? Um, and then the second part is, uh, sometimes advancement uh, folks get territorial because if you're trying to nurture a relationship with a bank or a credit union and they have an existing relationship with school of engineering or medicine or psychology they say hands off this is ours you can find someone else to uh, go and ask so how do you navigate that i know this is a long question at the end of a, a long discussion so we can take it offline if needed I mean, I can, I can talk about how we navigate it as a partnership program um, at Davis. So what I would say is that, I mean, there, there's kind of two things there. Like if you're, if you're looking for kind of what the farmer's agreement is or what that relationship is, I mean, I can help with that if you wanna reach out, uh, we can have that conversation. Uh, my counterpart at UC Berkeley, um, Amy Garner, she's currently overseeing the, the UC partnership program. So they're right wanting to look at system-wide partnerships. Um, but from an advancement standpoint, you know, I just make sure that I have a close relationship with them, but also try to delineate the difference between a gift and a marketing partnership. And really what the difference is, right, from my perspective, is that a gift, someone's giving that, they're not expecting anything in return. Um, but for a marketing partnership, you know, they're expecting basically to sell their products and services um, to your stakeholders. So... I think that it's important to delineate that. Um, I would say that the other thing is for those who don't have a partnerships office, the other thing that I would probably have a conversation with is the athletics third party rights holder. They're always looking for ways typically, right, to enter, to get onto campus because they don't have access to those rights through their athletics partnership. So there may be a way, right, that they may find that as value um, to add uh, to potential deals. But with that said, you should know your sponsorship benefits and your marketing assets very well, and then what that value is um, before you go into that conversation. Great, thank you very much for that, Heather. Lauren, Joy, Kevin, would you have any other pieces to add? Because I, have, I don't have anything. <laughs> no, yeah. I think Heather spoke well to that, so I'll let Joy speak. I think it's so interesting because we care as a UC system so much about collaboration, um, but when you get down to it, some people can be pretty turfy um, about like, no, 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 this is my person not yours. Um, so I think being able to stress that like, hey, we're not trying to like steal them from you and get them to come to us. Um, it's building a stronger relationship with the UC system in your particular location. Um, and I don't think that that's a bad thing. I don't think they're ever going to take half of their marketing budget for engineering and give it to staff assembly. And on top of that, everybody that you're talking to that's a fundraiser or other person that's holding that relationship they're on staff. Um, so at the end of the day, money in the door for staff assembly is benefiting them. Um, so those would be the two points that I would stress. Okay, great. And thank you all for that. And Nagan, thank you for that question. I am happy to begin to wrap up. I'm going to drop a few links into chat for everyone if you want to copy them down. And I'm going to do a quick share screen as well. So anyway, there are the links. And here is the share screen to support it. I want to first say thank you sincerely to our panel. This was a really enjoyable and informative discussion. It will be recorded and online for anyone who wants to check it out later. And looking to this next month, we do have quite a few things coming up related to Kuxa that I wanted to share. The first one is our town hall, which will be in about two weeks. And that's going to give broader updates in relation to Kuxa as an organization. And then our next Kuxa chat will be on September 28th. 
And it's all about how do you manage your time as well as your responsibilities as a staff leader? Because I think sometimes that's something we have issues with. And so I've got the best time management specialist that I know that's also a mentor of mine to present it. And that'll be a really good discussion. And I do invite y'all not only to complete the post survey that's in chat, but also to stay connected with KUXA as an organization. We are very active on social media. Our website has quite a lot of content and we love to spotlight the work that's happening system-wide as well as locally. And that includes a newsletter that debuted earlier this month. So please find your ways to engage, connect with us. If there are topics you're interested in hearing, please feel free to share that with us, with me, and we'll see what we can do. But that concludes this Kooksa chat. Thank you so much for giving us some of your time. And for my panel, you should know that more than 30 people held on through lunch. So that speaks to the knowledge y'all brought to it. So thank you for that. Thank y'all for participating. Get to your next meeting and have a wonderful rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you.